Okay, in this video, we're gonna take a look at the structure and function of a few organelles here. And when looking at organelles, it's a good idea to take a look at specific real actual cells so that you can help to try to understand how the organelles help the cell do its actual function. So in this case here, we're looking at a close-up of a typical animal cell, but specifically, uh, we've been asked to identify an exocrine gland cell of a pancreas. So basically, if you understand what a pancreas is supposed to do, the pancreas produces all kinds of different proteins and hormones and enzymes. So it's a good place to start when you think about what a cell actually needs to be able to do. So in the case of an exocrine gland cell of a pancreas, if there are a lot of enzymes that need to be secreted in large quantities, we have to actually be able to process them and then transport them to the plasma membrane and then release them. So you're going to be expecting, you know, a lot of vesicles, a lot of things that can produce enzymes, so a lot of ribosomes. And so these types of functions can help us predict what we might find in a cell like this. So obviously there's going to be a plasma membrane as all cells have a plasma membrane. There's going to be mitochondria used for energy. There's going to be a nucleus that's going to be giving out the instructions. We've got the rough ER, which is different differentiated from the smooth ER. Rough ER is going to be rough because it's going to be covered with ribosomes and we know we want a lot of ribosomes because we have to synthesize a lot of proteins. Golgi apparatus will be necessary for helping to package a lot of the proteins that get produced and sent into vesicles so that we can actually secrete these enzymes outside. Remember, if the proteins are produced on ribosomes that are attached to the ER, then their final destination will usually be outside of the cell. Therefore, we need to put them into a vesicle and transport them by exocytosis. And then obviously we said uh, vesicles and lysosomes will be present. These are a little harder to differentiate from vesicles, but uh, for the most part, you won't be asked to identify lysosomes compared to other vesicles, or you'll be able to get a point for answering both uh, of those if you identify something as either one as the vesicle or a lysosome. Over here, it's a good idea to take a look at a plant cell as well, but instead of saying a typical plant cell, we've been asked to make sure we know uh, the general structure of a palisade mesophyll cell. And again, they've picked a palisade mesophyll cell because that is a typical plant cell when you think about what plants are capable of doing. So if you don't know what a palisade mesophyll cell is, um, if you take a look, if you just type this in, you take a look at any kind of leaf diagram, palisade mesophyll cells will be the cells that are always towards the top layer, not the exact top layer, but just underneath the top layer uh, of cells in a typical plant cell. So that's the place where a lot of photosynthesis is going to happen. So if you think it's got to do a lot of photosynthesis, then it's a good idea to stop and try to predict what types of organelles you might expect to find in a plant cell that's supposed to do a lot of photosynthesis. So it needs to be able to do photosynthesis and therefore uh, be able to convert light energy into organic compounds. So obviously, um, if you know anything about plant cells, then you know that chloroplasts that contain chlorophyll are the ones that enable photosynthesis to actually happen. So in a plant cell, we would expect a cell wall. That's one thing that differentiates it from a animal cell. Uh, in a previous video, I talked about three letter C words that help to differentiate plant cells. That would be the cell wall, the chloroplasts, and a large central vacuole. So there's the third C. So cell wall, uh, chloroplast and central vacuole would be the three things that we're looking at that have the letter C. Obviously, we have a plasma membrane inside of the cell wall to help things move in and out, a selectively permeable membrane. Chloroplasts, which give plants their characteristic green color that contain chlorophyll, which is the protein pigment that allows light energy to actually get absorbed. Mitochondria, this is something that people miss. So oftentimes they think mitochondria versus chloroplasts, they think that animal cells only have mitochondria and plant cells only have chloroplasts. In fact, plant cells have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. They may make some organic uh, substrates like uh, glucose and sucrose being made here, but they're also using them for respiration as well too. So we should expect to see mitochondria in there. Uh, the large central vacuole that stores nutrients and acts as a place for sap and also gives the cell some of its turgor, T-U-R-G-O-R, -R, to give it some strength because plants don't have bones. Also, of course, the nucleus to help it uh, 
dish out its directions. It contains all the genes for carrying out all the different activities of the cell. One more thing we'll take a look at is a little chart that summarizes which organelles have a single membrane and which actually have a double membrane. And by single membrane versus double membrane, what we're talking about is not just one half. We're not saying a single membrane is half of a phospholipid bilayer. We're saying a full phospholipid bilayer that you'd expect at, at the plasma membrane surrounding the cell is what we'll consider to be a single membrane. And a double membrane is actually when you have two layers of phospholipid uh, bilayers actually. So the single membrane ones would be the rough ER, a smooth ER, rough because it contains ribosomes, smooth ER because it does not. The Golgi apparatus is also a single membrane organelle, lysosomes and then vesicles which will be pinching off of the Golgi apparatus. The double membrane ones are a nucleus which has a double membrane the mitochondria and the chloroplast and this is significant especially for the mitochondria and chloroplast so when you actually look at a diagram that i've tried to sketch here but for some reason my ink has gotten thicker so you'll have an outer mitochondrial membrane and an inner mitochondrial membrane you'll learn more about this in the respiration unit and a lot happens between these two membranes but if you zoom into this outer membrane you'll just see a regular phospho phospholipid bilayer. If you zoom into the inner layer, this inner mitochondrial membrane, you'll see another phospholipid bilayer. And there's a region in between that's called the intermembrane space. So the origin of these guys, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, follows something called the endosymbiotic theory, which is the idea that larger cells took in smaller cells. And you can imagine that if a larger cell took in a smaller cell, then you would have a double membrane because both of those things had a membrane to start off with. So if one cell is now within another cell, then you'd expect there to be double membranes. So anyways, that gives extra evidence to support something called the, the endosymbiotic theory. And then one last thing to think about is this idea of compartmentalization. You know, if you take a look at prokaryotic cells versus eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells like bacteria are small and they don't have little rooms inside. In other words, they're not compartmentalized. Whereas in a eukaryotic cell, there are separate areas and there is compartmentalization. One of the main advantages is that you can have, I mean, the same advantage of having rooms in a house is that each room can have very different conditions that are kept separate from other rooms. So if you have enzymes that are stored inside a lysosome, for example, and the lysosome's job is to kill other things like bacteria, then the enzymes in here won't leak out and accidentally start destroying yourself and other parts, other rooms in the actual cell. So those are some advantages of compartmentalization. So hopefully you got a good uh, summary look at the different types of structures that you would expect to find in cells. It's a good idea to know, you know, remember the names of the, the palisade, mesophyll cells as a typical plant cell, and then also remember the name of this particular pancreatic cell called an exocrine gland cell, which purpose is to really produce enzymes and secrete them. So good luck with all of that.